Certainly glad everyone is here back with us this afternoon. Jason's doing a little housekeeping here. The only sick that I have to add to her list uh, is Diana Hobgood will be having tests Tuesday, and so she has requested prayers. Let's keep her in mind. Are there any other sick we need to make mention of? Do y'all have a ramp this week? Sure. No ramp this week. Just remember the things that are ongoing. There will be a bridal shower Saturday for Kirsten Walker here at the building. That's at 2 o'clock. There's information in the bulletin about that. And next Sunday, um, Jim Roberts will be here uh, to speak. He will be speaking. We, we will not have our singing, but he will be speaking for class and then uh, worship on Sunday morning and then speaking Sunday afternoon and then next Sunday is Stilly House and I'm not sure if we have a speaker signed up yet but uh, be making plans to attend uh, the Stilly House. We have our lads, the leaders people back so we're glad to see them back with us this afternoon. Is there anything else we need to announce? Anybody wants to help donating food for the ladies' night, that's uh, April the 13th, Saturday, April 13th. If you want to help with donating food, you need to see Kenley or Corey Kate. Anything else? All right. Number 760, who will follow Jesus?
Anybody know this song, There's a Redeemer? It may be new to you, but it's a pretty song. sing that again pretty soon. This time we'll have our opening prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us come here this afternoon to worship you and to study from your word. Please continue to be with this congregation here at Walnut Grove. Please continue to bless us and all the efforts that we have ongoing to spread your word and to reach out to the community both here and far. Please continue to be with our eldership here as they lead us. Please help them to always stand for the truth and to lead us in a way that's in accordance with your word. Be with every member here at Walnut Grove. Please can continue to bless us and give us all good health. And be with those that are struggling with their health and dealing with different issues and sicknesses. Please help them to regain their health, if at all possible. And thank you for giving everyone a safe trip back from Last to Leaders, and thank you for the Last to Leaders organization, and good work that they do for so many children around the, the country. Please continue to bless their efforts, and be with those that are still traveling home from uh, different places from all across the country. And thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for sending him to this earth, and thank you for him establishing his church, and thank you for the forgiveness that we have through his death. And please be with us and help us to be willing and eager to teach those about the church and about the forgiveness that everyone has access to. And be with us throughout the rest of this service, and be with Jason as he brings us the lesson. And thank you so much for. Uh, his willingness to come here and to present your word to us every week. And please continue to bless him and Jill and their entire family and the work that they do at Christian Courier as well. And please forgive us when we fail you. 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We shall see the king someday. No, the way we shall. Song of encouragement. Where, where's my number at? There it is. Tomorrow may be too late. Brother Jason. Good afternoon. It's good to see everybody for our 130 service. I enjoy being able to visit with two of the elders over lunch, Murray and Lonnie, and as always, they are very encouraging and, and supportive. In fact, they said if I wanted to give them a little preview for the lesson, they could get their nap in <laughs> ahead of time. So it's good to have that kind of support, isn't it? No, they are supportive, and I appreciate them very much. And I appreciate all of you for being at this afternoon service and thinking about how the Psalms can help us. And that's clearly God's purpose with Scripture. I love Psalm 19, verse 7. The word of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. If God were to make a book that is actually perfect for the soul, this would be it. And He did. And we can be blessed by it. And so, as you know, we've been making some observations through the Psalms. And really, in this particular Bible study and our Sunday afternoon sessions, we've been thinking about how we could take this home and apply it if we wanted to do some personal and devotional reading from the Psalms. We could do it by making these observations about the different kinds of things going on with these prayers. And we're here at number seven, our final, what we've called tool for spiritual enrichment, and that is look to Jesus. Because some of the Psalms do speak about Jesus. He said so. And he said all the things written in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me must be fulfilled. So what do we find there? 
and how could they help us? We find various psalms that anticipate who Jesus is, what he was going to do, what he would experience. And that's why in appealing to Hebrews 12 too, we said we could take these psalms just like we can go to the Gospels, obviously, and read about Jesus. We could go to these psalms and see some special insights as sometimes we have record in the Psalms of God the Father actually speaking to the Son or the Son speaking for Himself. So they are unique and they give us another angle with which to love Jesus and learn about Him even more. Now, as we begin this particular reflection on Messianic Psalms, we talked about Psalm 2 last week, or, or a couple weeks ago, that is, last time we were together for this study. And we observed, as you see on the chart, Psalm 2 is quoted in the New Testament these several times. It's quoted in Acts, in particularly chapter 4, with reference to this idea of people rebelling against God. But God sees this coming. He is not surprised by any of this. And that all of this was detailed and foreknown. Gave the church an encouragement. Because as they observed persecution themselves, they could take comfort in the fact that God knows what's going on. God has worked His plan in spite of all the evil in the world. And we could benefit from it if we stay loyal and true. And... So they were blessed by doing what we're doing, going back and looking at these psalms that speak about Jesus. There's this one particular statement in Psalm 2 where God the Father speaking to the Son says, You are my Son, this day have I begotten you. We've noticed how that is applied to His physical birth. It's also applied to His resurrection, being Born again, you might say, just like we are when we obey the gospel. In those defining moments, when he came into the world and when he was raised from the dead, in those defining moments, we see who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. We're going to add to that these passages you see on the chart. And look at Psalm 110. Look at how many times this psalm is quoted in the New Testament. The Matthew, Mark, and Luke references all are referring to the same incident, so you can kind of lump those together. But we also see this repeated by Peter on the day of Pentecost, by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and then twice in the book of Hebrews. Now the passages that we're going to look at today are kind of in the same vein as Psalm 2 in one particular sense. And let's see if we can pick up on that. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You're going to have to stay with me now just for a few minutes and think about what is the common denominator in these four texts from Psalms. And of course the New Testament references will supplement our study. But let's go to Psalm 45. And we'll read the appropriate verses in just a minute and think about the point that is made when this passage is cited in Hebrews chapter 1. So we're going to just simply read the two verses here on the chart, Psalm 45 verses 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. 
you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, just on the surface here, before we turn to the New Testament, there's something very curious going on, wouldn't you say? There are two people here in this verse that are identified by the word God. Divine persons. First, notice this detail. This person addressed as God in verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So whoever is referred to here as God reigns, is on a throne. Well, that's who God is. Well, there's more to it than that, right? But we also see in verse 7 that this reigning God, or the one who is mentioned as His throne is forever and ever, is anointed by someone who's also called God. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. So what's going on here? When we turn to Hebrews chapter 1, we see the psalm is quoted in verses 8 and 9. And when you look at Hebrews chapter 1, you'll be reminded of the fact that there are numerous passages quoted and Psalm 2 is quoted like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So this whole chapter is talking about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God having of old times spoken unto the fathers and the prophets by divers portions and in divers manners hath at the end of these days spoken unto us, how? Through His Son. Who, and then there's this description of the Son. Then there are these quotations. Who is the Son? We're talking about the Son of God. And He never said this to any of the angels. And here's what He said. We get to verse 8. But of the Son He says. Now who is He? But of the Son, He says. Somebody's speaking and talking about the Son. And note what God the Father says. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, go back with me to verse 5 just to notice something of the continuity here. Verse 5 says, To which of the angels did God ever say? You are my son. Well, to none of them. But verse 5 identifies that God the Father is going to say some things and we ought to take note. One, he never said this to the angels, but he did say it to his son. You are my son. Verse 6. And when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says... Who's he? The speaker is still God. Or of the angels, he says. Verse 8, of the Son, he says. So identify here that God the Father is speaking in these Old Testament scriptures that are here quoted. And when you read Psalm 45 and you read this statement, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It is God the Father who is speaking of the Son and calling Him God. So this is a 
clear affirmation of the deity of Christ and of the plurality of persons, because there are at least two in this verse, who are God in their nature. There is the Father, there is the Son, and of course we know there is the Holy Spirit. But in this verse, we have one divine person speaking to another divine person, the Father speaking to the Son. So this is an observation to make. That in the Psalms, before the Lord's ever born, before we start reading in the Gospels, there is an indication that the one who's going to come and reign and rule and fulfill God's plan, he's not going to be an ordinary individual. He is a divine person. The deity of Christ is affirmed even back in the Old Testament that the one coming, the anointed one, was no ordinary human being. Now, let's add to that Psalm 97, verse 7. And we read the, the New Testament quotation already since we've been in Hebrews 1. Let's just lay our eyes on it here in Psalm 97. There's an interesting twist here that can be a little bit confusing if it were not for the New Testament interpretation because we're, we're not used to this type of language. In Psalm 97 and verse 7, the text says, All worshipers of images are put to shame. What's a worshiper of an image? What's another word for that? Idolater. So, worshiping false gods. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship Him. All ye gods. Now that's where it gets strange. As if there are multiple gods out there who are encouraged to worship Him. Sometimes in the Old Testament we find that various individuals operating on behalf of another take on or assume the position of the one they represent. The New Testament passage interprets this for us. Those who are called gods here are not deified beings so much as they are individuals who operate on God's behalf. But who are we actually talking about? Well, in Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 6, in quoting this passage, in other words, in the New Testament we have an inspired commentary on what that verse meant. Not that there were all these gods out there, but the reference to these individuals were representatives of God, not deified beings. Because here's the interpretation. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. So in quoting that passage and giving us an actual interpretation of it, we see who exactly was under consideration in that verse. Well, that's, that's the unexpected part why the word God would be used for angels. That's not the only time that happens in the Psalms. And sometimes they are referred to as the sons of God, but not the Son of God in the sense that Jesus is. But with that obscure use of language aside, let's see the most important part of this passage for us. 
Who are they to worship? Whoever they are. Hebrews 1.6 says it's a reference to angels. But who are they told to worship? Jesus Christ. When he's born. As a baby. When he comes into the world. God commands the angels to worship him. Isn't that fascinating? You know we see these kinds of scenes. Through the book of Revelation. We have doors open, we look into a throne room scene like in Revelation chapter 4 and also in chapter 5, and we see this in action through these chapters, that is the angels worshiping God and worshiping Jesus. And here we learn by this passage, this little insight that when Jesus is born, God said to the angels, worship him. That ought to take your breath away. As that little baby was God in the flesh. It's hard to get your mind around, but that's the truth. And so the word became flesh, the eternal word. Co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And he was worshipped by the angels. Well, let's add to it Psalm 110 verse 1. What's the common theme here in all of these passages? In Psalm 110 and verse 1, we read this. The Lord says to my Lord. Now who's speaking? David is. And David says, the Lord said to somebody else, to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, we can't get any better than Jesus himself commenting on this passage. You can turn with me to Matthew 22 if you'd like. And see the moment Jesus brings up this verse. As we... Turn to Matthew 22. We're actually turning to the last week in the life and ministry of Jesus before his death. And this day is often referred to as a very busy day. In other words, there's a lot of information recorded about this day. Probably corresponds to Tuesday of this last week. And it was a day of controversy. This is the day he's peppered with questions. This question and this question and the Sadducees have a question and all of this. And what was the purpose of these questions on this day? Were the Pharisees just thinking, well, now that we have a chance, let's ask him a question. Or the Sadducees, you know, I just have a burning question. I'll ask Jesus. No, that's not the reason for these questions. So trying to entrap him and embarrass him in front of the crowds to discredit him, they were working feverishly on coming up with the question that is going to ensnare him. And of course, as always, Jesus mastered the moment. Well, now he has a question for them. And you know what his question has to do with? Psalm 110 and verse 1. And let's see how Jesus frames the question. And we're going to begin our reading in verse 41, actually, Matthew twenty-two forty-one. 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathering together, Jesus asked them a question. 
What do you think about the Christ? Now they would know what he meant by that, right? Remember when the wise men came from the east and they came to Herod to find out where the Christ was to be born? Where's the king of the Jews to be born? And he inquired of the scribes. Where's the Christ to be born? The Samaritan woman said to Jesus after their conversation at the well, I know that the Christ comes. Philip and Nathaniel, the others, looking for Christ, the one of whom Moses spoke in the law. So everyone in their culture, in their society, knew that the scriptures foretold the coming of someone who would be anointed by God. Now, they don't believe Jesus is the Christ or they're putting their heads in, their, in the sand because they don't, they don't like what they see so they're just going to act like it's not there. Whatever, they're not acknowledging Jesus is the Christ. Well, he has a question. Okay, the Christ. Whose son is he? How did they respond? He's the son of David. Everybody knows that. He's going to be a descendant of David. 2 Samuel 7, 12. He's going to be a descendant of David. Now, do you think he knew that they would answer like that? That's what he wanted them to say, right? Whose son is he? David's. Okay. Why did David, look at this in verse 43, in the spirit, Isn't that a little powerful statement that David's not speaking here of his own intuition? It is a statement of the inspiration of this verse. So the Christ is going to be David's son. Well, why did David say by inspiration that he was Lord? Why does he call his own son Lord? And then he quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. So Jesus appeals to this passage that was indisputably about the Christ. And when David spoke about the Christ who was his son, he called his own descendant, my Lord. Why did he do that? And what was their answer? That was it. Just stunned silence. They didn't have anything to say. And as a footnote here, when Jesus follows up and gives the question, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? It says that's when they decide not to ask him any more questions. The more they ask questions, the worse they look. So they decided to just end it there. Now the question's still open for us to think about. David referred to his descendant, his son, as Lord. How can the Christ be both David's Lord and at the same time his son? And what's the answer? Because he is. At the same time, the Lord and His Son. Through Mary, by being a human being born to her, He was an actual descendant of David. But He didn't have a biological father. Joseph was not His biological father. He didn't have a biological father. He didn't begin to exist when conceived in Mary's womb. He always existed. The Creator 
John 1 verse 3. Without him was not anything made that hath been made. And then he became flesh. And so that's the answer. And so we see that this passage is appealed to on a number of different levels. One, Jesus appeals to it to highlight his nature. He is at the same time God, David's Lord, and man, David's descendant. Peter appeals to it in this passage to talk about sitting at God's right hand. That involves the ascension. That After Jesus was raised from the dead, He would ascend back to the Father and sit at His right hand, enthroned to rule over all things for our benefit. And so we can appreciate this passage on many different levels. I want to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 1 for a minute and see this very matter described in a different place. There's not an appeal here to Psalm 110, but the essence of who Jesus is is again reiterated by Paul. And we'll think about all of these scriptures and how this verse in Romans chapter 1 is kind of a commentary on all that we've read this afternoon. So let's just begin in verse 1, Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand, that is God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That would include Psalms, wouldn't it? God promised the gospel beforehand through the Holy Scriptures. Well, particularly, what about that? Well, about His Son. Now look at this description of the deity and the humanity of Jesus. His Son, who was descended from David, Now look at this descriptive. According to the flesh. And was declared to be the Son of God. In power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Descended from David... Son of God. He's the Son of David and the Son of God. And that's again, in essence, Psalm 110, verse 1. He is the Son of David, but David addresses Him as God, my Lord. And so we can appreciate that here as well in Romans chapter 1. So what's the common denominator in these passages All of these psalms refer to the deity of Christ. Every one of them are prophetically announcing the one who's going to come and fulfill God's plan for the salvation of mankind is God. And the New Testament then identifies for us that when Jesus came, He was no ordinary man. He himself was God. And again, this ought to just absolutely thrill our soul that God, in the person of Jesus, that is, this person we call Jesus, who was named Jesus, Because he would save his people from their sins. His name means Savior. Did not begin to exist. He became a human being at that point, but he did not begin to exist. Because he always was. He is a divine person, just like the Father and the Holy Spirit. But he's the one 
of the, th of the three divine persons who took on flesh. And why did he do that? So he could die. So he could taste of death for every person. So that he could become a sin offering so that we could become the righteousness of God. He took on our sins, Peter says, to bring us to God. And just like we talked about this morning with reference to Jesus' agony, His agony in the garden, His anticipation of suffering was even dreadful. Because as God in the flesh, He had the capacity to suffer like no other. Now, what's He doing? He has the capacity like no other to on the one hand sympathize with us and on the other hand stand before the throne of God and intercede for us. That is astounding. As we read in Hebrews 7.25, He ever lives to make intercession for us. We don't have a high priest that can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but one who's been tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And that is why we should approach the throne of grace with boldness. That we may find mercy and grace to help us in the time of need. His capacity to feel for us and appeal on our behalf to the Father is like no other. And that ought to thrill our soul. Jesus before His Father for us. Our advocate, 1 John 2 and verse 2. Well, there are other things that we can read about in the Psalms concerning Jesus. And as we work our way through other Psalms, we will see how much there really is prophetically about Jesus in this special book, about what He would do and experience and so forth. But in these we see His divine nature. The one who would die for us would Himself be God. Well, Thank you for being here and a part of this study. I appreciate each one of you for taking time to be engaged this afternoon in our Bible class. We'll conclude by offering the invitation if we can help anyone this afternoon, if we can pray with you for any reason, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. Today is a day of salvation, tomorrow may be too late. The Savior is yet to be laid, except our saving grace. His life on the cross he has given, oh come our death to pay. His earnestly pleading, oh make no delay.
I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm really enjoying the study in Psalms. Thank you, Jason, for bringing these good words to us. Is there any other announcements we need to make before we dismiss? Okay, if you're in our assembly this afternoon and did not have an earlier opportunity to partake of communion, if you'll exit during the singing of this song uh, to the room behind the baptistry, someone will be there to serve you. We're going to sing number 720, watch and pray first and last verses, then we'll be dismissed in a closing prayer and go out and make it a good week. pray our father in heaven we are indeed grateful for the first day of the week when we assemble to worship thee the true and living God we're thankful for the lessons that we have heard today and we pray that we may learn from them and take them to heart realize that we need to serve you as the true and living God. We're thankful for each one that has chosen to be here and we pray that you will bless us as we go forth into the week that we may look to thee for guidance, that we may search your word, that we may offer up prayers to help us do the best that we can while here upon this earth. Father, we're thankful for all those that have gone before us and uh, made the way for us to have the truth. We're thankful for those that continue to proclaim the gospel, and we pray that you will bless them in whatever they endeavor to do and wherever they are located, that they may stand for the truth. We're thankful for the church here and ask thee to continue to bless it, bless each and every one, and help us to love one another. And ask thee to forgive us of our sins wherein we have failed thee, and help us to be able to declare thy word as we go forth this week, as our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.